Today, we have Ramon Williamson as our guest in the Coach Me to Lead show. Welcome, Ramon. Hey, Erno. Great to be here. So I'm so happy that Ramon is here because uh, we've been talking at the background and coach at me a couple of times. Um, he's a um, well-known life coach, maybe as he says himself, the world's well, most well-known life coach already coached a lot of people. How did you get to coach um, so many people in your career? Hey, well, Erno, I I would say I'm 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 probably not the most well-known life coach, uh, obviously, but I have um, certainly my peers have called me one of the most experienced, having started in 1986, and um, I I'd like to say I had some uh, foresight, um, you know, sort of prophetic premonition or something about the world of coaching. But really, I didn't. I I had reached a certain point in my career where people had started asking me about, you know, how to, um, you know, what I'd done and how I'd become, uh, I'd reached a certain level of success at that time. And people started asking for my help. And uh, the um, this idea of coaching them um was a relatively new idea at the time. And there was an opportunity where I connected at that particular time with a man who was considered uh, or is now considered uh, the father of modern coaching. And he had this big pasteboard box that he sent through the mail. And there was about 500 sheets of paper and about two containers of audio cassette tapes and that was as far as i know the first ever training school uh for coaches and so you know i started listening to the to the tapes and i just started coaching people i started having conversations with people about what they wanted um in terms of their goals and what they were trying to accomplish and uh, they responded and uh, a lot of people got results I, like I said, I wish I could say it was a, you know, it was a, a deeper, more profound situation than that. But really, it, it really wasn't. Your um, career has been pretty um, colorful. Let's put it that way. Uh, as I as I read through your LinkedIn profile, and you've been um, training, you've been doing presentations, speaking um doing movies doing writing but i think most of it um is coaching since what you said 1986 but what what led you to coaching at that time when it wasn't you know such a um well known or even accepted um practice well i i think it's important I think it's important for me to share uh, sort of my philosophy about about coaching. Um, coaching is simply a tool for developing human beings. I see it as a, um, I think you're one conversation away. Most people, when they think about their life, they can uh, connect the turning points to a conversation or an event where everything changed. Uh, they had a conversation with someone, they were able to see it differently and therefore act on it differently and it changed their life. So um, for me, it, it was just a vehicle to help people. Um, I felt it my, my calling in life's work to help unlock and launch people into their, into their destiny, what they felt like they were put here to do. And I imagine that if I were not a coach, I would probably be, uh, you know, uh, well, then later I became a personal growth and development speaker. But I think that, um, yeah, you're, you're asking me like how I got into coating. I think the, I just did it. 
you know, I, 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 like I said, I wish there was a better, you know, there was a better answer I could give, but I think fundamentally um, I see coaching as a, as a tool for unlocking and launching people. Um, I, I remember one of my early mentors saying, the thing we want most is someone who will make us do what we can. And I think people get unlocked and they get long, launched into life because somebody comes along and, and recognizes them, sees them and says, you know, uh, you're more than you're living. There, there are possibilities in your life that I see that, and often we don't see it. And that person comes along and they begin to have a conversation with us. They begin to, we begin to have a conversation with them. And as a result, um, we begin to see ourselves differently. We begin to act on life differently and things uh, change dramatically for us. How, how do you think that the writing, because you wrote um, six novels, if I'm correct, and one screenplay, um, how do you think that writing influences your coaching? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I never thought, I never thought of myself, and I, 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 I don't still think of myself as a writer. Um, and, you know, for years, I coach clients in Hollywood. Nobody knew me. I think the closest I got, the closest I came to being outed is I was living, um, I was living on a farm at the time. And I just out of the blue, I got this call from uh, Us Weekly, which was like, you know, one of the, the Hollywood rags at the time. And she was asking me about, you know, yeah, we heard that there was this coach. And, you know, are you that guy? And, and it was like, I was really caught off guard because the way I really built my career, which was really interesting, is I said, no one will ever know that you're, that I'm your coach unless you tell them. And so obviously that was terrible for marketing, but it was really great for building trust with clients, especially high profile clients who other people always made their career off of them, you know, they would say, well, I'm so-and-so's coach. I'm so-and-so's trainer. I'm this, I'm that. And so I decided to, you know, people were it, it, it sort of like they would zig, so I decided to zag. And, um, but nobody knew me, you know? Like I said, today I'm virtually, I'm virtually unknown uh, in the coaching world. I'm, I would be called contrarian by my peers. I break all the branding rules. And yet I've managed to um, earn a living and, you know, have a pretty good life over the past uh, 37, uh, 37 years in this field. And, and I love it. It's been a gift. I'm, 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 I'm humbled and filled with gratitude that people let me talk to them. And I'm excited when um, some of those people actually go on to do some pretty remarkable things. Um, you know, I've had, I used to have a seminar that I led called Coaching Weekend, and it was at a beach house. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was always, uh, you know, I had my, at that time, I had little children, and they, they, all they wanted to do was go to the beach house. Um, but my son recently, he said, you know, he said, I remember being at the beach house, and I remember people coming to the beach house, and he said, you know, somehow they left different. And he said, I've, you know, I see people now and I'm like, oh, that, that person was, you know, at the beach house. And so I think that, you know, you asked me about writing. Um, I, I literally got an F in high school English and had to go to summer school. I the la I'm the last person that should be writing anything probably. Uh, I remember there was a news article written about me um, in a hometown newspaper some years ago, and it said, talker in school now paid to speak. And, and they were talking about how the file, you know, the fact that I talked so much as a child, the teacher would put me in the hallway. And, um, but they never wrote an article about me as a writer, you know, because not only did I not think I was a writer, nobody else probably thought I was a writer as well. But the way I got in, um, got started writing, and it's an interesting story, is I've, uh, I've contributed um, little snippets to probably um, 
seven or eight movies, um, uh, Hollywood movies. I've contributed little snippets. And I would just be that guy in the back of the room that maybe the actor brought along or maybe the producer brought along. And they, they'd have this conversation and, and, and I'd say, well, how about trying this? Or how about trying that? Um, and I never got any credit. I, I'm still, I'm still um, uh, wondering when I'm going to get this screen credit or I'm going to get this royalty check, you know, uh, maybe this coming up. But I would just, just kind of be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I'd contribute something and people would like it. And, um, and the good news is they kept paying me as a coach. I guess there was some, you know, there was some benefit in it. But um, the way I wrote the six novels really is I met a girl uh, in TJ Maxx, which is like the uh, it's like the, the department store kind of place uh, here in the states. And I'm and I was looking for a shower curtain, and literally it was on the I think it was like the thirtieth of October or something. It was like this Day of the Dead, and she was dressed like a witch. I mean, literally, true story. I can't make this up. And, you know, she had this witch costume on. And so I look at this, I look at her and I'm like, yeah, she's the one. Like, just weird, like some kind of weird, you know, deal. And so she helps me with the, the this shower curtain and um, uh, <laughs> and she gets the, you know, she helps me with the shower curtain and we, we, we strike up a conversation. And um, a few years later, we've written uh, six novels together. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's how it's happened. And then um, a production company that uh, does some work with Hallmark approached me um, some years ago and I thought it was going to be my big break, right? You know, I'm going to finally be someone who writes something for real and I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get credit for it. And um, so that's kind of still in the process. You know, I think, I think movies like take like 20 years. I'm just convinced that, you know, uh, that they happen, but maybe something will come out of that. Maybe it won't, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting story anyway. Do you, so, so your way used to be, um, that you were coaches of people, you were a coach of people who, you know, it was like a secret that you were the coach of them. Now you are one of the coaches on the platform coach.me. So that's more public. Um, do you feel it was a good decision that um, being this different, being like the invisible coach? Yeah, or would it, you have done it differently now? <clears throat> well, I would have done a lot of things different now. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I wouldn't change a thing. And I said, well, you haven't paid attention. Because <laughs> um, anybody's paid attention to their life, you know, uh, there's a bunch of things they would change. Um, I would change, I would have changed a lot of things. Um, I, um, you know, I wouldn't have changed being sort of the, the sort of like, I don't know if Cyrano is a great analogy, being sort of the Cyrano, um, kind of behind the, the, the wall there feeding the words. Um, I loved that. I loved that. It, it was the most fulfilling thing to have, been a part of something and see it and you know i just kind of say yeah you know uh, i was able to help that person a little and it was it, it was really fulfilling to me uh to do that not 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 so much it, it just kind of happened that i said that because um way back in the day there was an agency in new york and they somehow connected with me and i know how i was i was in i was in new york at the time um meeting with someone because I was always trying to figure out like how to get myself out there and how to, you know, every motivational speaker or anybody like that, they, you know, they want to be famous in their thing, you know? And, um, so I was, you know, I wanted to kind of get out there and, and, and so the meeting at this particular, this big public relations firm, somehow, um, the agency, um, that was doing a lot of stuff in Hollywood at the time, knew one of the guys that was in the PR thing. And they said, oh, let me introduce you to this guy. And we just met. I think we talked maybe three minutes. You know, it was kind of like one of those Hollywood things in New York, like, hey, you know, and maybe we'll do something. And when you're in LA, let me know. <laughs> you know, it's like that kind of deal. And um, 
but I got a call from them and uh, one of their clients was just in a mess. Um, and so I kind of fell into being that, you know, the coach that nobody knows that people call when um, they're having a big challenge in their life and they need to get through things. And mind you, I don't have a, a psychology degree. Um, I never really pursued real certification, uh, quote unquote. Um, it just, uh, you know, again, it was like, it, 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 we made the whole thing up, you know, in reality. I remember back in the 80s when, you know, people were, they had this big idea about coaching and it was going to be all this in a bag of chips. And the reality of it is, I remember um, having this camp meeting, this campfire thing, like at a little campfire thing. And that's where a lot of the stuff that people are so, you know, mixed up in today about coaching and that kind of thing. That's where this stuff was made up. Like, we just made it up. You know, <clears throat> I remember <laughs> one of my early, um, an early, uh, you know, you could call him a mentor or, you know, he was the guy who made that pace for box and he said you know what i just took a little bit from here a little bit from there a little bit there and bam coaching and um, i think people take it too seriously today i mean it's a big business it's a billion dollar business you know in the name in some form or fashion of coaching and i think it's great but um you know like i said i it was it, you know it's been a, and i'm still trying to figure out the story to tell about it um i don't know i've just i've just shown up I've operated from one primary value. Um, and Tim Sanders, um, who was at Yahoo, put words to it in a book called Love is the Killer App. And he said, love in business is intelligently sharing your knowledge, your network, and your compassion to create value for others. And I think if you go through life with that as a value and you look for ways to help and be a generous human being and reach out and not worry about how you look and what people are gonna think of you, and, you know, is it on brand or not on brand? And a lot of these things are good. I mean, if you're, if you're building a, a big company with a product and, and all, of the, all of those things have its place, but I think um, as individuals, and I think more than ever, um, individuals have a, like, I have this thing about brand, you know, people talk about brand, you think about colors and you think about logos and all of this thing. I think brand is the story that people tell others about you. I think it's the, you know, you got to ask yourself at some point, what's the, the biggest promise that I can authentically deliver on in the marketplace, uh, in the career place? And you, you really look at and ask yourself, well, how do I really help people? And, and what is the difference that ultimately I can make? And then something comes out of it. And you got to put a label on it at some point because that's what helps people to understand and make sense of what you're doing. But I think mostly people haven't made sense of what I do over the last uh, 30, 37 years. And I've constantly tried to reinvent myself and try to, you know, call myself this and call myself that. And in 2015, when I met Tony, you know, <laughs> virtually, Tony uh, who's the founder of, of, um, of Coach I mean, it was Lyft at the time. I was just fascinated by this idea. And I was a terrible, I was a terrible coach, me coach, because I was, I was used to talking to people. I was used to having a conversation and listening. And now all of a sudden I couldn't listen. I'm texting, you know, and I was probably still old school, you know, because I'm obviously not a millennial. So I don't, text is not my first um, in language. <laughs> okay so I, I was terrible i was terrible and i was crushed because somebody on the app said the most experienced coach here is an amateur like they really said that like it's one of these millennial guys he was like two you know and on the app and um and a lot of you know we're, we're talking about managers and leadership and this kind of thing and it's very interesting because you know there's such a disconnect between managers you know sort of like the old guard and the millennials, you know, and there's all this conversation going on, but they're just like, they're, you know, it's like the, the boomer is from, what was the old thing? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Venus, yeah. So maybe the, the boomers are from Mars and, and the millennials <laughs> are from Venus, you know, or they're, they're, they're two species sharing the same reality to move the company forward, to, to accomplish what is needed, but nothing else. Uh, you know, their paradigms are different, their, their values are different. Uh, it comes just from a whole different world. 
And I think that a lot of um, what I've tried to do um, is look at myself and, and think about, you know, what I really want to do. I think I'm only to a point now where I'm probably going to, you know, be able to help people in, in, in a better way. Um, because a part of leadership is that, you know, people have all these, these grand definitions of leadership. And I think mean, leadership is a play. Leadership is more than a title or a thing. It's where you get to the point where you're past you as an individual. Past and you? you? Hold on, hold on. What do you mean with past you? Well, you overcome you. The ah. biggest problem in your life isn't uh, corporate. It isn't the economy. It isn't the fact that people are getting laid off now. The biggest problem in your life is always you. Because it's never, you know, what happens or what you experience or the opportunity or the setback. It's always what you say that thing means. And so we go through life, you know, picking up these significant emotional experiences where something happens and things are not the same. We make sense of it or we try to make sense of it. And we end up with a, a, a sort of a, a, a patch quilt of self-identity. And so we're always trying to figure out, well, who are we in the context of this or that? And the truth is um, what springs from that without accurate thinking and processing things, like the most dangerous thing in your life is how you process a disappointment or setback because it becomes a part of that patch quilt. And that patch quilt is really the frame of mindset. Like mindset isn't this like mysterious thing. It's a filter through which you see life. And that self-identity and what you say about yourself is is everything so when you're in a situation whether you're managing whether you're building a business whatever it is ultimately it takes a certain level of personal growth and development hmm. to reach a point where you can overcome you and you can see things the way other people uh don't see them and but the truth is is i don't think erno most people most people are really not interested in that journey they're just interested in whatever they're interested in and interested in whatever they're doing. But I think the true leaders um, in history, and, and I've just had a, I've had a, I, I, I've been in rooms most of my life that I should not have been in. And observing those people, and, and by the way, the benefit was when I learned to shut up. I learned to stop talking about me and what I wanted and started listening to what they wanted and what they were saying. And that was like my PhD in, right. in life and human beings. And so what, what, what happened at that point is I started realizing that the most effective leaders uh, are, are the exact opposite of most people in any situation. They listen, they bring context, they, they create new frames of perspective and they just show up in an entirely different way. Hmm. And most of the time, um, they don't they don't say as much. You know, they. I remember I had this this one guy. I was uh, I worked. I was a national lecturer with one of the prominent um, uh, platform organizations that did these seminars all around the country. And I I remember the the guy you know coming in the room and when he was a master at erno he wasn't a master at 25 things and knowing 25 things but he was a master of listening and he would ask one or two questions and the one or two questions would reframe the whole thing and 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 like the conversation would open up and i think there's a way where leaders uh show up like that and it unlocks other people Right. You know, where it's really not about the leader, it's about the people in the room. And the leader is more like a, a, almost an orchestra conductor. And there's this beautiful harmony and synergy of where one plus one is three. Yeah. And there's an exponential, you know, dynamic. I think it was uh, Napoleon Hill that wrote in Think and Grow Rich. He said there's three fundamental keys to success. Um, and, and the story is that he interviewed um, over a 20 year span of period of time, the most successful people of his generation. Yeah. And he wrote a book uh, that few people know about called Laws of Success. That was his first book, uh, first significant uh, book in his philosophy. And then his second uh, book, which everybody knows, um, 
and, I, and it's probably that's not all he wrote, but the second significant book was Think and Grow Rich. And he was asked to boil it down to the three most important things for success based on his observations. And he said, there's three things. You've got to have a definite purpose. You've got to have specialized knowledge and the power of the mastermind, where there are two or three, two or more people operating in a spirit of harmony, whereby that one plus one equals three. There's a, there's a higher reality that happened. And that's really what leaders do. Okay, well, okay, Ramon, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because they do those three things consistently. So, um, I think you are a leader. So, so what are the three things for you? The three most important things for life. In, in, no, the, in... answer the, the if you answer the three questions of um, of the book of Napoleon. The, the yeah, three... definite purpose. Right. So, what is your definite purpose? My my definite purpose. The the whole. The whole, and this is sort of a personal thing to me. Um, I had a spiritual encounter in 1988 at a pivotal point in my life. It was the second significant spiritual encounter that I had. The first was um, in the uh, in the 70s, and then, and I was very small. And uh, then in in 1988, um, I, I had a spiritual encounter. Uh, and the, it, the, the, the thing that, that sort of like, um, became the primary lesson of my life is love. Um, my definite purpose is to learn how to love because I realized in that period of time that I didn't know how to love people. Hmm. I didn't know how to love. A lot of times when we are so focused on ourselves and our own hurts and our own challenges and our own wounds in life, we never really learn how to love. We're so busy trying to heal, but we don't know how to heal, whether it's at a personal level or a professional level. And so, you know, I don't want to get too deep into that, but, you know, that's that, that's my definite purpose. My definite purpose in life is to is to learn how to love. Right. Um, and if you look at the, at the at the second thing is, um, so, so what is the one thing that you do? Because you, it seems for me that you do many things. What is it that you do that you feel is the most important thing that you do? The definite, the definite purpose. Yes. I'm able to, I'm able to grab ideas from the universe. Uh, that is my, that is my super, what do they call it? my superpower skill. Right, right. I, I have a unique ability to look at a person in a situation and to see it in a way and articulate it in a way that it becomes something that's valuable. Um, that it's, it's taken me all of my life to recognize that ability. Hmm. Um, I still struggle sometimes to monetize it because it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to talk like this in, in whether a corporate setting, uh, but there's some people who just, they get it because they see it and, and they hire me and they, they, um, they like what I do. But um, I would say, and, and I've probably never said that publicly before, but I would say probably that's my, that's my specialized knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my, that's my gift. I think every person has, um, I have a client who's an educator and he's building a, um, he's, he, he's, he's writing a book and he's building a program uh, to help parents. And th the thing he says is that everyone, every child is smart in some way. Hmm. He said, your goal as a parent is not to determine if your child is smart, but how is your child smart? I think there's an application to that, to human beings. The question is not whether you're brilliant, it's how are you brilliant? Right. And most people spend so much of their life trying to conform and fit in and become what they think other people want them to be. They never take the time to find how they are brilliant. Um, uh, one mentor, mentor calls it your secret wealth. He said right. there is within every individual's life uh, these secret jackpots the, of opportunity. If they're recognized and, and believed, uh, they would create enormous value. So most people don't value the thing 
that is their brilliance. They don't value, they don't appreciate the thing that is what makes them unique because all of our lives we've been taught, you know, fit in, conform, and that kind of thing. So I think for me, um, I think probably, I, you know, I may have actually missed my calling. I think I would have done very well in advertising, um, you know, because I've, I've helped influence probably, you know, a hundred different brands that people would know about. So, um, but yeah, I grab, I grab ideas from the universe and I help people to translate those ideas into things of value right. that helps so, in so improve if, the lives. If you of look people. at that, if you look at your unique ability and your um, purpose, and and you look at coach.me what do you think that that is the next step for you on coach.me what do you think is the next step for coach.me this is interesting because um i i you know i begin a, a new um kendra came in as ceo um which um can you re uh, she she is really brilliant. Um, she's a, she, you know, you talk about people doing a bunch of things. Like, what does she like drive motorcycles and, you know, uh, what is she doing? Like Iron Man and all this kind of stuff, you know, it's like, um, she's just an amazing woman. Um, I think, I think, uh, I think like where I can see coach.me go. So for example, uh, async coaching. The use of async messaging uh, to coach is the next great innovation in our industry. Most will not be able to embrace it. It's a little bit like the telephone uh, versus the telegraph. Right. Um, it's it's radio and television. Um, and coach.me is uniquely positioned to not just lead the way because it, it, coach.me was a pioneer in async messaging in 2015 no, coach coach via text people were just trying to figure out getting coached over the phone <laughs> you yeah. know in many ways yeah. um and and they had you know they had all these different flavors and thoughts about coaching but what coach.me did was it brought it brought it, it, it brought the essence of human transformation uh, to one idea. And that one idea is that everything you want to be is a habit. And and the truth of high performing people, whether it's in corporate America, whether it's in um, you know entertainment and creative, whether you you know, run a business where you're trying to figure out the internet. You can boil down what you want to accomplish to one habit. And when you repeat that habit, you have what I call a repeatable and a reportable, and you're consistent, it will change your life. And it's the only thing that really will. The secret of your future is hidden in what you do daily. And so you can have all these grand plans and grand ideas and you know, uh, you know, just fill in the blank. But until unless something becomes a part of your life daily, where you can move from the idea of it to get a steady flow in your life and build momentum where there's a compounding um, learning and understanding and growth in a particular area, very little, very little happens. Um, uh, Certainly, nothing remarkable. Hmm. But is, everything is, is, happens. Is that is that the, the um, super habit? What you would call the super habit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like what I've what I've been since I got into this um, conversation about Coach Me over these past few months, I've been thinking very deeply and experimenting in conversations to find. Uh, what I've referred to as the super habits. Now, people don't really want to hear habits from me um, because they've already got their, their big habit three. 
Um, you know, there's the one guy that we talk about that wrote a book. Then there's the atomic habits and then there's the tiny habits and, you know, and I'm sure there's two or three more out there that I don't know about. So people don't really want to hear about habits from me, but I, but there are, in my observation, three habits that drive the modern economy. And you can, you can get coached on those habits in coach.me, but I think, first of all, you've got to recognize and appreciate the profound value of these habits to change your life. Because most people are chasing two rabbits hmm. in life. Um, and the person who chases two rabbits doesn't eat. So you got to figure out what's my one rabbit that I'm going to chase in my life. How do you become, as we talk about, the only choice for a certain kind of client or the only choice for a certain type of whatever, you know, in, in an industry. Um, people are getting laid off today. Well, the people who aren't getting laid off are the people who have been able to, um, you know, find the one rabbit that they're gonna chase. They become, they, they, they not only gain the, the specialized knowledge, but they persist in the thing long enough to develop a certain amount of expertise and understanding that helps uh, them show up in a remarkable way. So, so, and I don't want to go off on too many quote unquote rabbit trails here, but um, I think coach, coach.me is in a unique position. And the thing that I have uh, been trying to understand and articulate in these these past few months is what are the super habits in life and uh, because i'm now working with a lot of people for example who want to they want to have um they want to have uh flexibility and freedom in the way that they work um i boil those habits down to three that are coached on the platform there's three habits on the platform, and, and, and whether you are um, in a corporate situation, whether you are in a own your own business situation, you're transitioning to an own your own business situation. These are the three essential habits to understand and master. In other words, go get a coach today. Don't, don't waste time in these three areas. Number one is setting priorities for your day. That was the original super habit that I discovered. Uh, setting priorities for your day the day before is arguably the single most important thing you can do to transform your focus. You don't, you don't need an app. You don't need a fancy planner. You don't need to go to a seminar to learn a system. You need an index card and a pen and you set a, a, a time at the end of your work day, I call it review preview. You set a five minute appointment with yourself and you ask and answer three questions. Number one, what did I do right today? Number two, what did I learn? And number three, what will I do different moving forward? If a manager in corporate America institutes review preview with their people and they train them to create a progress report on a week over week basis with week over week accountability, your whole company will change. Your entire company will change in 12 weeks. Um, a lot of people you'll see ought not be on the bus. Um, but the people who are on the bus and the people who decide to rain, remain on the bus will be radically different and the results that you begin to experience as a company are radically different. You, you, you need a value that everybody buys into, and you need a practice that continually helps them to level up. Um, so that's one. Um, everybody ought to be coached in setting priorities for your day, everybody. The second uh, habit that I think is essential today is the habit of one social media post adding value. Um, it used to be a time where only entrepreneurs engaged in 
marketing. You've got to engage in marketing uh, as a career professional today because uh, LinkedIn just isn't about getting a job. You don't just come to LinkedIn when you need a job. You come to LinkedIn to engage in a conversation that proves your competence and that demonstrates the value of what you bring to the table. And you do that by writing publicly on LinkedIn. It's one of the most important and, 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 and powerful career or life moves that you can make um, because you are literally one conversation away. You don't get promoted because you have a great resume. You get promoted because someone in a position to help you sees you and they like you for whatever reason or they connect with you and you get to advance. Um, and then the third habit that I feel like is essential is one conversation, start one conversation. Now, these three habits are not at all what people expect, but in the modern economy, if you master these three habits, it will change your life. In the modern economy, if you master, when you master these three habits, it'll change your career. And you will be in a place where you won't worry about getting laid off. You won't, you won't get concerned about when the economy changes because value is value. In a good economy, in a bad economy, the person who had the real skill is not uh, your degree or what you've learned. The real skill is the ability to bring value and perspective and understanding into uh, any situation in life. And that person is always going to um, that person is always going to win. That person is always going to do uh, something remarkable. Yeah, I agree. So I want to make sure that we um, show some of the comments of Sunny Johnson because she's been replying to what you were saying. Um, your content is great. I couldn't tell that you made a film. I, I think it's an, it's a film, right? What, I'm not sure if that's <laughs> correct because it's not English. And the last one is a question. It says, how are you brilliant? Because she's she's just quoting some of the things you just said, which is great. And yeah. um, I love it. Um, thank you, Sonny. I think for, you got to ask yourself that. Yeah. You, know, you got to ask yourself, you got to ask yourself that. Um, and then own it, then yeah. fully embrace it. And it may take you, it may take you a while. I think there, there are a lot of people in the world, Erno, that are, you know, they're in their 40s and their 50s. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, and if you're in your forties and fifties, if you're Gen X, uh, you're in the best place of your life because you have unique skills that the people coming behind you really don't have. They haven't developed the same kind of skill set, and you have enough of the technology piece that is sort of like the driver in the economy right now. And if you can, if you can, if you can bring those two things together, you have a distinct advantage. You have a distinct and unstoppable advantage. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited for, you know, for Gen X, not just because I, you know, I am one, um, but because I think that so many people are like missing the boat. They think, well, I'm too old or I really can't compete or I can't, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it, it's really nonsense. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a false belief. It's a lie that we've told ourselves. There's also a tremendous opportunity with millennials. I have uh, three, four uh, natural children um, and some, you know, and, and three other kind of, you know, adopted in, grafted in children, are all in their 20s. And I think 20 year olds, you know, if I say one thing to 20 year olds, I'd say, um, find a 50 year old hmm. that will tell you everything they know. And actually listen. And allow yourself to go on a journey over the next two to three years, 
processing life that you don't have access to. Uh, my mother says something to me very early in life. She said, Ramon, you can learn more from the experiences of others in this life than you have time to learn for yourself. <laughs> there was a reason that apprenticeship drove the economy hmm. for a significant period of history, because there was a transfer. There was a transfer not only of the skill set, but there was a transfer of the mindset. People are always talking, well, I, I need a mentor. Uh, you know, I, I want to advance my life. Well, what would you suggest that I do? You're in your 20s, find a 50 year old that will actually talk to you right. and understand that the person is going to be hard to listen to. Um, and if you listen and you stay in the conversation, you'll gain a perspective, you'll gain wisdom and understanding that your peers don't have. And you will have a remarkable advantage. Uh, I remember a client of mine uh, told me something one time. He said, in your 20s, it, you know, life is for this. In your 30s, life is for this. In 40s and 50s and that kind of thing. And so you have a tremendous, uh, everybody in their 20s now is trying to have in their 50s results or in their 40s results. And the truth is, is that if you will value where you are and allow the process to really get a hold of you, the life process to work in you, you will be amazed at what you'll accomplish over the next decade, the next two decades, the next three decades. Right, right, right. Okay, so um, I really want to thank you for bringing up the book of Tim Sanders. Um, it's been a while since I've read that. Um, and also the last thing I want to show here is um, this remark by Sunny is saying, now everyone is sharing their life on social media. It's telling me, it's challenging me to share as I go. I have done a ton of things and coached tons of people's, as you say, invisible coach. Yeah, I can imagine how sometimes that's difficult if you're not sharing, like, like you made the, uh, clear the second oh. um, uh, uh, great um, habit is, you know, having these conversations on one hand that's the third one but the second one is you becoming visible on linkedin having conversations there meeting people there publishing um, great posts there that's yeah, really let me, important let, let, let me jump in and and, and 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 just help i think it will help people to realize that we're all asking the wrong question hmm. you see social media is about the platform not about you Social media platforms want you to feed the news feed. They don't really care what you post. Uh, they just want you posting and inter interacting and engagement, and that's good for their business, and they sell ads and they make a lot of money. But we're asking the wrong question. The question is not, how do I post on social media? Or what do I write on social media? Or any of that. The question is, how can I reorient my thinking to, you know, because the, the, the modern thinking, modern business, modern value adding is to career in public. It is to, it is to coach in public. And when you're in public, you're bringing people on a journey. Listen. Your credibility on LinkedIn or anywhere else has very little to do with your years of experience, your degrees, your certifications, or the companies that you've worked with. And until and unless you have credibility in, in the mind of somebody out there, they're not going to pay attention to you. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to buy from you. They're not going to hire you. The way you get credibility is by doing something interesting. The way you get credibility is uh, the, way you, the way you get you have to get the right to solve a problem for another person. And the way you get the right is not the certification, not the class you took, but you actually get the right by doing it, doing something interesting and then telling people about it, sharing the lessons, the insight, the understanding. And when you do that, you are a category of one. See, there's nobody like me in the whole world. I'm, I'm totally convinced of that. That's not an ego thing. That's an appreciation and recognition thing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so how have you helped people or how do you help people? Then uh, number two, 
who do you help? Who is already looking? I love this quote. I had a mentor years ago. He said, I'm a walking reward to 10,000 people. I said, I love it. I love it. And, and he says something else. He said, I'm looking for the people who are looking for me. Imagine if you showed up in the marketplace like that versus trying to write that viral post or get that kind of slick thing that you can send in the DMs or the, or the inboxes. What if you showed up for, with, with, a, with a different perspective? You showed up with a perspective of the value of love. You showed up with a perspective, a mindset that said, I'm a walking reward to 10,000 people. You showed up with the idea that I'm going to intelligently share my knowledge, my network, my compassion. I'm going to create value. I'm going to be a generous human being. That's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different perspective. And then social media is only, social media is only the canvas, the walkie talkie, the, the can on the string by which you share your observations, your lessons, your understanding, bring people on the journey. The fundamental issue that all of us have is that we, we have an internal resistance based on, we have an internal resistance based on inner conflicts that call us to pull back, call us to um, be concerned about what, what are they going to think? How are they going to see me? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we're so concerned about that, that we're hiding and holding back. What if we just showed up and we said, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm learning this. If you want to do it, let's learn it together. Let's go on a journey together where we learn and do this. You do that 100 days in social media, you're in a whole different place. You've got an audience. I heard heard a a, a man that I uh, started with many, many years ago in the software business. He said, he said, do it for, publish for a year, two things will happen. You'll find your voice and your audience will find you. But almost nobody gets that. Almost nobody gets that. There was this Caribbean chef that I met when I was doing Google Help Out. And he said, you know, he said the best advice he got on social media. And at the time, he had like a million people following him on uh, Google+. Plus. Great strategy, wrong platform. Uh, But he said, he said the best advice he ever got was two things. He said, get on social media and just start helping and interacting and meeting people. And then number two, understand that every, you're mo- going to be mostly ignored for the first 18 months. Yeah, that's a great point. And I found that to be, I I've, I've found it not only to be excellent advice, but I found it to be the gospel truth. If you pay attention in social media, the people that you think are just huge, that's all they've done. They don't have any magic fairy dust that somehow makes them this or that. They've just simply, um, they've had, they come to social media with a beginner mind, chop wood, carry water, then they blow up. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And it's the same for your career, but we're always like in this rush. I talk to clients all the time. I feel like I should be doing more. I feel like they have this anxiety about their life. I think it's, we're in a season in life right now where things are changing so fast. The best thing you can do is respond in an opposite spirit. Take a deep breath, reconnect with who you really are as a human being and what you have to offer. Heal the mess that it's important to heal in your life so that you, can, you, 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 you get the path clear. And you go out and you just start loving people. You practice the habits that actually make a difference, and you you stay in a conversation with people who are not going to lie to you, people who are going to tell you the truth, the truth about who you are as a brilliant human being, and the truth about what's possible for you. And you keep leveling up against that reality. You're going to look up in 12, 18, 36 months and have a whole different life, have a whole different perspective. And it, it's going to it's going to impact people. Um, I know one of the things you wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, the corporate the corporate stuff. Well, I, um, 
we already gave so much content. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll pause here and yeah. probably we will just come back uh, in a later show to you with more insights here. And I just want to um, thank you, Ramon, for, you know, sharing all these nuggets and insights that you have from coaching, from coach.me, from um, marketing and um, giving these great book quotes that you, you know, great ideas for books that you could read and how you can operate and how you can find more clients. Um, and if you're watching, thank you for watching uh, and being with us today here live or just watching the video afterwards. Um, we will be back next Friday. Um, Sunny, also thank you for being here and for chiming in. And next Friday, we will have Jeff Fayans or Fahans. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I will learn next week. <laughs> so um, thank you again, Ramon Williamson. Hey, thank you, Erno. It's really nice to be here.